everyone. Welcome to Berkeley. It's, uh, it's a great evening to uh, welcome Michael, and it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Michael Freschetti back to Berkeley. Michael is a professor in the Department of Anthropology at Washington University in St. Louis. He earned his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania in 2004, and soon after joined the Washington University faculty. Since that time, Michael has distinguished himself in his research on the archaeology of Eurasia, paying specific attention to the pastoral nomadic societies that forged the networks of trade and communication that we today call the Silk Roads. His groundbreaking work has appeared in multiple books and articles, most notably in the journals Science, Plus One, and Nature. He's currently writing a book summarizing his and his colleagues' research on ancient Eurasia for Cambridge University Press. Michael's discoveries have been regularly featured in the New York Times, the Times of London, Business Insider, the National Geographic Magazine, and the National Geographic Channel. Today, Michael's a National Geographic explorer and a foreign uh, corresponding member of the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin. Dr. Freschetti is also a lifelong member of the prestigious but little known honorary society, the Louis J. Kolb Society of Fellows at the University of Pennsylvania. I can't help but take this moment to thank Michael for his friendship, friendship and his collegiality over the past two decades. Michael and I began our graduate careers together at Penn. There we joined a riffraff cohort of ambitious and irreverent young scholars, many of whom have gone on to marvelous achievements in archaeology and anthropology. And then there's Michael and, and me. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Although Michael and I ended up working in two very different parts of the world, we have remained in touch. For me and others, Michael's just a, a short phone call or text away uh, for advice or a sounding board uh, for new ideas, no matter where Michael might be uh, in the world. You never not, when you send that text to Michael, you're never quite sure uh, where you're going to, to be, and you hope you're not waking him up on the other side of the world. So, so tonight, Michael will speak on uh, Over Mountains and Steps, Tracing Ancient Tracks of Asia's Silk Roads. Uh, please give him a warm round of applause to welcome him to the podium tonight. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming out on such a dismal evening here in Berkeley. Sorry, that was St. Louis. It was snowing when I left, so I could be no more than happy to enjoy your sunny weather today. Um, it is a, this incredible joy for me to be back here in Berkeley. In fact, um, when I met Sanjo, now we decided 15 years ago, uh, it was in fact here, and I've been back a handful of times, and each time it's been a, a very stimulating engagement, and I hope again to repeat that, that um, the character of, of that uh, interaction. Um, I would also say that unlike most, perhaps, lectures of this nature, um, there's a lot of content, and I'm going to try to move through it somewhat quickly, which means that I'm perfectly okay with um, you stopping me. Um, it will pro prolong my voice, but nevertheless, it might be something that at the time, if you think of something, I don't mind. Others may not agree, but I actually find this to be sometimes more engaging with a diverse and educated uh, audience like yourself. So feel free to uh, do so. Um, the, both introductions, in fact, uh, save me time because uh, they, uh, both Sanjot and Ben also uh, b both uh, struck upon uh, key themes that I'll be talking about today. Um, and they're somewhat summarized uh, by this video that's been, been repeating behind you. Um, this is a, a, a slide that I won't have, didn't have time to incorporate into the lecture proper, but I wanted to lead with it and have you kind of digest it as, it, as you were waiting for this to get going. This is a, a high mountain fortress, a medieval fortress. This dates to roughly 1,000 years ago. Um, it was excavated in the, in the early 90s by a Russian uh, archaeologist named Svechkov. Um, and it sits like this today. These are drone this is drone footage that I collected in 2017. Um, and this is the first images of this site, um, well, aside from the five or six black and white photographs published in his PhD, um, ever captured of this particular location. Um, at least that I know of. There might be folks in the world who have them, but at least they're not uh, at large. Um, and you can see here a, a, a sort of a square where that flash just went off. That's the lower fortress, and we're looking down from the upper fortress. Um, and this was sort of always interpreted as a location of a stronghold, an imperial stronghold, uh, in this case of the Karakhanid Empire, um, and sort of left at that. 
and this is how I learned about it, and it was sort of this mythical location. And I, when I actually climbed up there uh, to see what this place actually looks like, we realized that not only was this in a location that could not have been fueled by anything other than pastoral uh, populations, um, its sort of isolation in the high mountains here um, belied its function as sort of some strange outpost for a lowland uh, empire. Um, and in fact, that's one of the themes that I'll, I'll, I'll strike upon today, is this idea that when we think about the Silk Road, so much of what we think we know is derived from limited historical documentation and long-standing tropes that in many cases have very little archaeological truth to them. And so, um, or let's say have limited archaeological truth and can be exposed by new data. And so what today's sort of, you know, uh, stream of slides is going to hopefully do for you is provide you with a lot of firsthand new data, which is the result of about the last 20 years of my research in the region, and which spans from roughly 5,000 years ago all the way to essentially, well, effectively 1,000 years ago, to, to, the, to, the, to the Mongol era, let's say, so 700 years ago or so. Um, so it's quite a wide sweeping period uh, of, of data, but also uh, some, generic, or some, some general themes that I hope will draw it all together. Um, so, let's start with what we think about the Silk Road. Um, when you Google Silk Road, you get all sorts of interesting things, uh, which some of them we'll, we'll touch upon. Uh, nowadays, you can't Google anything. Um, we'll touch upon some of those, those concepts, uh, but I think the most common one is this sort of image of trade and prosperity. Uh, here's an artist's rendition of the city of Taraz, sort of the famous... Uh, northern Silk Road uh, trading center with its sort of pristine uh, defensive walls keeping out sort of uh, terrible barbaric nomads, um, civilized individuals on the inside, you know, pr pr writing poetry, trading, conducting commerce, and all the other things that we would expect of, uh, uh, of, a, of an educated cosmopolitan urban population. Um, while I can't say that that necessarily was, is untrue, what I would like to suggest is that this isn't the only image of Silk Road urbanism and sort of the height of the Silk Road that we can imagine. And I'm going to track you now back thousands of years to uh, help rebuild an image that is somewhat different from this. But we must, of course, start with a map because the Silk Road or Silk Roots or Silk Roads is a common, is a, is a terminology that only comes to us in the 19th century. I won't, I won't belabor the point, I'm sure many of you have heard it thousands of times, uh, but this is brought to us, you know, by the German, uh, th through the German uh, term, uh, what is it, Seidenstrasse, uh, and, you know, it's kind of conceptualized as this connective network. And here you see sort of the dominant routes, but what I want to point out is not so much the etymology of the term, of the term but the way we conceptualize Silk Road connectivity. You might think this is a road map, but what it actually is is a city map. And when you think about the way, for example, the recent UNESCO uh, nomination of the Silk Road has gone down, which has happened, it's actually a series of cities and a series of locations, not a series of connections. And so while each of those locations, those nodes, is sort of the, the, the instantiation of what the network may have been, our visualization of this is both, is, is essentially places that are just kind of connected by highways. First, this is the first thing we need to dispel about the Silk Road. I don't believe it looked anything like this, and I will, within the course of this lecture, show you what I do think it looks like and show you some of the evidence behind how that may have come to be. Um, but why is this important? Why has it spent so much time deconstructing this particular image? Um, oh, just as, as an aside, these two locations are, be, are where we will be sort of showing evidence from. So while I had a big map up, I thought I would just tag these locations here. This is the visualization of the contemporary, the modern Belt and Road Initiative, which again, I'm sure you've heard much about here uh, for those individuals who are interested in the Silk Road. And it's a striking similarity. In fact, it's no mistake because, of course, of course the Chinese government today inculcates the ancient Silk Road in its production and, and, and sort of expansion of its contemporary modern uh, machine. Now, this is not a, an indictment of the Chinese economic growth. This is simply a fact that we're, we're, we're witnessing in real time to the tune of $1.4 trillion expenditure by 2024 or something, the reproduction of a historical model which in and of itself may not be true 
And that has real implications, not only for what you buy at Costco, but it has implications for how those populations, the actual living populations of Western China, the populations of Africa, populations of across northern Iran and Syria and southeastern Turkey, how they experience this initiative. And I can tell you, my, this is sort of a total aside, I have a new project in the Maldives, uh, kind of out here. Somewhere. And the One Belt, One Road project is out there too. So this is a global phenomenon which harkens back to a trope, which isn't necessarily a real thing until we, as scholars who can pr provide a new model, actually expose it. And so I take this as sort of a, a, a mantra of sorts to my own research is to say, if we're going to live in the modern world and speak for human people, speak for hum humankind in any sort of relevant fashion, we should be able to rely on our research at least as a source of some validity in that voice. And I, I, so I put this up there as kind of a driving so source behind my work. But of course, we don't need to look at just the modern day. We can go back to, say, the original sort of opening of the Silk Road in historical terms, right? Um, this is the sort of famous, uh, the routes of the famous Zhang uh, Qian and his westward expeditions, which is basically uh, presented in China and elsewhere as the opening of the Silk Road. And again, another thing that I'm going to hopefully dispel in your mind, the Silk Road, there was no launch event to the Silk Road. Uh, the launching event, there was no cut ribbon and there wasn't sort of the final nail driven into the spike or spike driven into the track, the Silk Road had been functioning for thousands of years under some other name or, not, or no name. But nevertheless, this was probably not the opening of these trade networks. In fact, we know this, uh, and I'll show you some evidence shortly to speak to that. But of course, it's the reproduction of this idea in historical and art historical narratives. For example, in the, this now famous uh, Cave 323, at, uh, at Mogo Caves, um, in these Buddhist paintings, which are Tang Dynasty, you see the, de the depiction of Zhang Qian's Western Expedition as part of a uh, reproduced and re, uh, uh, retold narrative of China's uh, role in this global expansion of trade and uh, exchange. And of course, the Tang period is probably, for any Silk Road scholar, the Tang period is, has to be your favorite. If you don't like the Tang period, uh, especially given the nature of this, the name of this uh, lecture, then you have to leave. <laughs> um, I, no, I, I think the, the appropriate thing would hear, here would be to you know, say no relation. <laughs> um, these wonderful images from the Tang period of, in this case, foreigners. You know, these are traders along the Silk Road, but these are all categorized in every museum in China. I think I just came back from Xi'an three weeks ago and took these photographs, except for the one in red. The other photographs I took in the Shanxi Museum, and these are all depictions of foreigners. You have Sogdians, and what I can imagine as possible Sikhs, I don't know, they look pretty Sikhish to me, uh, with uh, some of the hairdressers, but minimally they're Central Asians and South Asians who are trading throughout uh, uh, China. These are individuals that are part and parcel of the Silk Road narrative in China, and yet somehow or another we still attribute uh, the Silk Road growth to this sort of spark moment in time uh, when Western emissaries, or when Chinese emissaries were sent to the West. The fact of the matter is if we just pick silk as, its own, you know, as, as this sort of apocryphal item, silk is found far earlier than uh, Zhang Qian's expedition, outside of the sort of territories most associated with China. The earliest silks, there's some debated silks from Egypt, there's some other debated silks from the Indus Valley that are potentially uh, a different source of silk weaving altogether. But in terms of Chinese origin silk, the earliest ones are probably found sometime in the mid first millennium BC, traded most likely by Scythian or Scythian type pastoralists across Eurasia through some vector entering into, into uh, Greece around the fifth and fourth centuries BC. Now, why is this significant? Well, in one sense, we have this sort of blank of thousands of years, because I'm, I'm going to show you that this goes back much earlier. We have this blank of thousands of years of exchange and trade in which nomads are sort of a big question mark, or let's say this shadowy uh, character in the narrative. And yet, 
it was, it's, almost, it, it's almost certain that the earliest expansion of silk itself comes through the vector of, of nomadic exchange. And I want to point out one other thing here. And this is just a sort of nuance, talking about the impact of how nomadic populations shape our world today. What do we notice about these two uh, images? One is that Alexander the Great here is depicted, you know, vanquishing, I think these are actually Parthians, um, and he's wearing a tunic, appropriate for Alexander the Great. Here, in a very similar art historical sort of reference, you see a Scythian prince, in this case on the hunt or in the fight scene, but what is significantly different about the Scythian is he's wearing pants. So anybody who's not wearing pants, raise your hand. <laughs> Good. Uh, short pants count, by the way. <laughs> um, you might say, who cares about pants? Well, this is the fundamental impact of the Silk Road 500 years prior to this, to the production of those two art historical uh, elements, you see the currently documented old, oldest known pants coming from the deserts near Turfan, uh, and these are associated with Bronze Age horse riders. Now, I can't go into too much detail as to how we know that, but we can partly see it from the grave goods and from the uh, pastoralist elements within the burial itself, and I'll come back to these pants later, but when you think about the fact that if you're a horse rider, wearing a tunic may not be so comfortable, that, then it makes total sense that this one innovation, which has now inundated the entire planet, right, and I have a, the whole lecture on this topic, uh, that pants have become this sort of icon of civilization. And yet, here they start in such humble beginnings. And again, I'll come back to the, to the specifics about this particular pair of pants. Uh, this was published by our German colleagues, Michael Wagner. The nomads who were wearing these pants were not the nomads clamoring at the gates of cities. These were the nomads who were maintaining their families and their herds in the mountains and deserts and plains of Central, and, uh, Central Asia and Western China. They were these individuals. This is a local herdsman who came to visit our excavations one summer at Bigash. You can see our excavation shovels down here. Um, this man had been looking for his horse, or looking for his, his, um, his uh, 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 what do you call a small cow, a uh, oh. calf. I, I, I just had twins like four months ago, so I'm going through a total uh, parental brain moment. So this is going to be a bit of a patchy ride here. So um, He had been looking for the calf that had been lost for something like two or three days, riding around. And this gentleman here, you can see, is also wearing pants. It's not these folks, though. This is the historical image of nomads, right? This is what uh, Sima Qian and Herodotus and all of the sort of early historians bring to us as barbarians, as wildlings, as people living beyond the walls who do nothing but wreak havoc on civilization. And that narrative has maintained. It's been maintained today. And who are the nomads of today? They're from Afghanistan. They're from the stands of Central Asia. They're Kurds. There are all these populations that get marginalized by part, in part because of their way of life. You could look, and you could extend this problem to many populations, not only those of Central, uh, Central Asia and the Middle East. But it's this historical moment, right, in the foundation of the Silk Road. It takes a Chinese emissary to found the Silk Road, when in fact that's not where it comes from. And so I'm going to be so bold as to suggest that the missing piece in our understanding of the Silk Road is in fact this history, this ancient history of nomadic pastoralism and how it evolves from a very, very early state, in fact, from its earliest times in Central Asia. So I want to turn to that theme uh, next. To do so, we need to first appreciate something with the geography of Central Asia. Um, for many of you, I'm sure you've traveled there uh, or have traveled to certain parts of it. This is a bit of a pixelated image, but it nevertheless kind of serves the purpose from a distance. You see how mountainous this region actually is. You have deserts here, which are lowland and flat, but most of Central Asia is incredibly mountainous. And so you might ask, why did I ever decide to work in Central Asia? The reason is, is because I loved mountains. And so I didn't want to work in hot, dusty deserts anymore. I said, I'm going upland where it's cool and beautiful and there's beautiful vistas. And that's why I ended up in Central Asia, because it's loaded with mountains. And this is key, 
because the mountains play a role in understanding how populations have both adapted to living there, but also how they helped shape these networks. But first, we need a little bit of background about pastoral economies in general and what's different and what's similar about them. The Eurasian steppe is a territory that's you know, roughly the size of the United States. And so, to, and so to subsume it within sort of one homogenous system of economy would be a vast error. So very minimally, I'm going to carve it into five or four, which is still a vast error, but at least it's less of an error. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the history of pastoralism and the key uh, benchmarks in that evolution. The first, of course, is the domestication of the horse. Um, I should actually not have an image of this horse. I should have an image of a Przlowski horse because uh, we have now understand the genetics of those early domesticated horses. But nevertheless, the earliest known domesticated horses on the planet, as far as we can tell, come from northern Kazakhstan at the site of Botai around 3,500 BC. Um, there's an incredible literature about this, and so if you just simply search those terms, you'll find all about it. In fact, this is a bit earlier and somewhat initially at least, uneventful for us. In spite of the concept that horses are so fundamental to nomadic societies, it turns out that that event takes about 2,000 years to gestate. And it's not until the end of the second millennium that horses really feel or find their greatest impact on sort of the world stage. So roughly the uh, end of the second millennium, the beginning of the first millennium BC. Are these economic uh, endeavors? And this is sort of the mixed form of multi-animal herding that defines the Eurasian steppe in different combinations. And so you can see here, I've scaled each of these cute little animals to uh, represent this sort of general sense of proportion in each of the regions. So in the western steppe, you have a greater reliance on cattle than sheep and then some horse. In the central steppe, there's a greater reliance on horse. And then uh, along this zone, which I call the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor, which is through this mountainous belt, you see a slightly different combination, and there's an interesting uh, element to those photographs, which is wheat and grain. And that's what I want to turn our attention to, is this band of mountains, which is so fundamental and so critical to understanding the relationships between north, south, east, and west across Eurasia. Oh, I should point out one last element. Farming doesn't cross that line into, into and across the Eurasian steppe until roughly 2000 BC. We have, I mean, there's been tons and tons of work over the last 10 years now on this topic of uh, the actual botany of all of this. And we just sim can't seem to find very strong evidence for farming moving off the foothills, off these sort of well-watered foothills of the mountains into the open steppe. Part of this is ecological, part of it's climatological, and part of it's quite frankly cultural. But we'll leave that for another time. I should say a few words about, about the genetics since it's just been published uh, no more than two months ago. Uh, this is a summary of one of the images from our recent article in Science on the genetic formation of South and Central Asia in which we describe a vast number of, of, of ancient genomes, 525 new ancient genomes, and in total almost 1,000. So the largest DNA study ever published. And in that study, what we were able to show is some interesting things relevant to, the, to our topic at hand. And that is, if you look at these genetic uh, sort of color, the, the colors represented here, they show uh, an Iranian um, kind of corpus and a steppe corpus being represented by different climes. So these are natural systems of, of engagement, and what you can see here is sort of a trade off between green being sort of a Western hunter gatherer legacy, ancestry, mel melding with a Iranian farmer and a Neolithic ancestry. And it flows right up through that mountain corridor, what I call the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor, or IAMC. That climb actually extends out to toward Bakhwatai, where horses were domesticated, as well as a number of other sites across the Eurasian steppe. And so we think that it's this vector that, in fact, we've proven it also with, with animal genetics, is this vector that brings the early sheep, at, sheep and goat at least, from the Iranian plateau northward into Eurasia and ultimately into China. Now, there's lots of complicated stuff here. It's not, you know, it's not a one-story uh, explanation, so there's lots of remixtures and admixtures, and we have some unique events like this one migratory event, which also likely brought some uh, domesticated animals uh, and strategies into the eastern part of the Eurasian steppe. But nevertheless, the genetics speak pretty clearly about this uh, major influence of this north to south climb through the mountains as early as around 3,500 to 2,000 BC. And this is the area, of course, we're going to be focusing on next, the sites where I've been doing my research. 
So to focus down, here's that view towards China here, looking southeast. And you can see China in the distance over the back end of the mountains and these sort of foothill sites in southwestern uh, Kazakhstan. Um, and I'm going to talk mostly about Bigash, but also a little bit about a few of the others. So kind of orient yourself to the disposition of these places uh, in, in their geographic locations. The Bronze Age site of Bigash was actually the site I dug for my PhD. It's probably the most hideous looking archaeological site that's, that has a Wikipedia page. <laughs> it's tucked into that little valley there. And if I, it's just simply nothing. It's still a small patch of grass with some stones sticking out of it. And only a graduate student desperate to get a PhD out of something could look at that space and say, I guess that's a PhD. And that's what I took, right? It turns out that not only was it one of the most important sites for, the under, for unraveling this mystery of early pastoralism, it happens to simply just be a treasure trove of data. We excavated it for four or five years, four years, and in doing so, we just peeled back, ex you know, in very, very excruciating detail, all of these little small uh, elements that al allowed us to do some big firsts. For one of the big firsts was providing a long uh, chronological sequence. So we put, you know, I think I had 35 in the end uh, radiocarbon dates. So we put a lot of money into radiocarbon dating, which was one of the first sites in the region to have such a comprehensive uh, stratigraphic radiocarbon sequence, which also illustrated nearly 4,000 years of repetitive occupation. So rather than imagine Central Asia as this sort of like, you know, crossroads of migratory populations shifting and moving, what we're showing is localized investment. Populations who know where they live, know what they're doing, they're building cultural territory, and they're building their own cultural landscape around this. And this is the themes of some of my earliest work and my first book. Just to give you a, site for, a sense for how uh, um, unappealing as a location it actually is, th this is uh, these are built-in trenches to a certain extent. They get sort of eroded rapidly after one leaves them, and you can see some of the new trenches. Um, but, you know, the, the site itself is what you'd expect from sort of about a 5,000-year-old sort of pit house in which people might have lived there for three to five months. Um, but nevertheless, it shows architecture, it shows numerous phases of occupation, and to an archaeologist, this is pure beauty. It also allowed us to talk about economy through time. And here you see the very detailed reconstruction uh, done by my colleague uh, um, Norbert Benecke from Germany with illustrating the, the proportions of animals. And what I want to point out to you, this was a huge controversy when we first published it. Horses almost never get above 5 or 6 percent. Now, you might say, well, that's because people don't eat them. Well, fine. But we don't have very many of them in the burials either. And so we're talking about a very small proportion of horse until a very late time in, our, in, in the history of these pastoral people. And so you say, well, how could they be pastoralists without horses? Easy. They walked. It's, you can herd sheep on foot. And so you see this propensity for sheep and goat, 70 to 80 percent in some cases, and it stays consistent throughout the entire life of the site. So st first thing we showed was these people are pastoralist. But then came the, the, the kicker. In 2007, I took my first graduate student, and his name was Robert Spengler, and he came in with some training in archaeobotany and wanted to work in a new part of the world. And I said, great, we have tons of flotation samples that we took at Bigash, and nobody to, to handle them. So here, here's your dissertation. And so he, in part with another uh, set of data, uh, started looking and sifting through the flotation samples from this site. And what he found was quite amazing. Um, these are the oldest, well, at the time, the oldest known uh, evidence for domesticated grains north of basically the, the, the Sierra Daria River. So this is, the, in the steppe, in fact, the only, old, the only and oldest known agricultural evidence for quite some time. Um, what it also showed, and perhaps as important, were t two domesticates that come from different sources. One on the, on the one hand, broom corn millet, which is an East Asian domesticate, and wheat, in this case, bread wheat, which is a Southwest Asian domesticate. So this got, started getting us thinking about some real evidence for connection at a very early date, in this case, 2200 BC, or roughly 4,000 years ago. Fast forward another five or six years, and another three or four PhD students, and we've got even more evidence for this kind of uh, occurrence. In fact, we targeted a site called Tasbas, which was the one further to the north in that 
isometric view. Taspas brings us back to before 2500 with some of these early grains, again found in the cremation burial, very similar kind of ritual. And we have then again in a later phase, another long period site, we have evidence for actual uh, agricultural farming, in other words, actual practical farming with rachises and all sorts of other evidence for proper uh, crop processing. So we see this transition from early use within ritual context to um, a later use of full-blown full, full blown farming, but as an augment to a pastoralist lifestyle. Now, this was still in flux until fairly recently as a, as a hypothesis. But we were able to make this argument, and that was as early as 2500 BC, so 4,500 years ago, uh, we have evidence for East Asian domesticates and Southwest Asian domesticates being shared in one location. And uh, I can promise you that this was happening not only 4,500 years ago, but in fact 5,000 years ago. But this is sort of, you know, the as, as I get older and older, I keep, I keep rounding the numbers, so it just becomes, you know, sooner, sooner it will be 6,000, 7,000, we'll, we'll have it back to the Paleolithic. No, <laughs> there's, there's actually strong evidence coming out of the Altai and other areas to suggest that this, that this process, which we document as early as, I mean, officially as early as 2,700, in fact, starts at the beginning, roughly, of the third millennium BC. Um, there's an interesting sub-narrative to all of this, and that is the millet, which is an East Asian, uh, itself an East Asian domesticate, uh, and this is some of the work, um, again, by myself and Robert Spengler, but also by Naomi Miller, and now more recently by my colleague at Washington University, Xin Yi Liu. Um, what we can see is that the millet sort of follows the rainfall to a, to a large extent, and or river, river systems, but it also uh, follows pastoralists. And partly we think this is because millet is a low investment crop. You can plant it, move around, and it will gi give you yields um, without an enormous amount of labor, um, depending on what you want, you know, what you want it to do. Um, and so we've sort of made this observation that you know, this might be correlated, in fact, with pastoralism, the early spread of, of millet itself. And then came this paper, which was just published in September as well. In fact, one day before the science paper was published, um, my former student, uh, Taylor Hermes, who's now a postdoctoral uh, candidate, a postdoctoral researcher in Germany, um, is, and who's an isotope specialist, illustrated using Bigash, Dali, and Tasbas, the sites that we, we've been working at, that not only were these uh, places prevalently pastoralist in their character, but that the, anim that the animals were eating domesticated grains, specifically millet. And we can show upwards of 50 or 60 percent foddering so that we think the actual integration of millet, which in China was a human food, was for a thousand years at least utilized as a fodder crop for pastoralists. So when you think about that sort of origin, if you will, of these initial sort of connections, that first mark of east to west connectivity comes one on the back of pastoralists, but two in a way that we would never have imagined, uh, in a sense, to feed animals. When we see wheat finally redeployed again in China, and wheat then makes its way to China, uh, around the same time, it slowly integrates into the food culture there, takes again about a thousand years. We see some of the initial ca cases of it, uh, in part from due to recovery, but in part I think also uh, factually because of the way it was being used. We see it being used as an offering in burials. Um, and so you see this little basket here was full of wheat grains at the now famous site of Xiaohe. Um, and you can see more domesticates in some of the other images. This site is extraordinary in its preservation because of its, d its desert location, but again, allows us to tie some, make some connectivity between the, the sites in Western China and those in Central Asia. Remember the pants? Let's talk a little bit about the pants. It's not just grains that were flowing up and down the mountain corridor. Um, it was everything. I, we could have, I, I could have put in 15 slides on metallurgy. I can put in 10 slides on, 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 on textiles. And in fact, there's, I read, one of the papers I read by Irene Good some time ago, who's a specialist in silk, suggested that silk initially wasn't the commodity that we actually think it should have, should have, that it eventually turned into. That in fact, linens and flax and other cloths that were seen as far more prestigious amongst uh, populations living out and around um, the sort of boundaries of imperial China were far more uh, valued. Um, thus, it's not strange to see other kinds of textile traditions 
predating sort of this expansion of, uh, of silk itself. Here you see this interesting uh, weaving pattern known as a twill. Now, anybody who's wearing jeans is wearing a twill. Jean, a twill is a very durable uh, and very comfortable uh, cloth weave, and, and it's one that's great if you're a person who spends a lot of time on horseback. That's why cowboys wear jeans. Cowboys in Central Asia wear woolen twill because they don't have indigo. So, or cotton, yet. Yeah. And we say, okay, so this is now thought of as some of the earliest evidence for twill. And you can see that twill uh, sort of girdle that says part of those, those pants. Well, we've also got twill at Bigash, but we have it in a very different way. So, a lot of the ceramics that we have, this is the work of one of my other graduate students, Paula Dumani, Dupuis, who's now a professor in, in Kazakhstan, in fact. Um, she is sorting through, she's a ceramic specialist, and as she was sorting through the um, numerous, you know, thousands and thousands of fragments of ceramics, she noticed that many, many, many of them had textile impressions. And so we had to figure out how and why these textile impressions were ending up in the final product for these small handmade vessels. The answer is quite clear. They were using them as like shields for molding. So you'd put down a vessel, drape it in a cloth, expediently make another pot, pull it off, take out the cloth, and you've got yourself a molded vessel. But it leaves us a beautiful tracer for all the textiles that they were using in this fashion. And so without going through all the kind that we have, I want to focus specifically on this piece, which is a twill. Now, dating ceramics and dating, you know, it's not as easy, but we have pretty good chronological control at Bigash. And what you can see, this was published uh, in Quaternary International in 2017, you can see that um, our sort of fill layer here, where this sample comes out, pushes this date minimally back to about 1,500. So we're amongst some of the earliest known documented twills in the world at this little simple site in the mountains of Kazakhstan. Um, there's a lot more to be said about that. Here's those, those pants that I was telling you about, M21, right? Here's some of the other ones I showed you. So we, we're all in the ballpark. It's roughly the latter half of the second millennium BC that twill becomes a type of weave. Now you might say, okay, but what you, what's, how does this tie into the Silk Road and to the connectivity that we're interested in? Well, first of all, it's distributed across the region, as you can see, but more importantly, it's how you make a twill. Most weaving done in Central Asia, even to this day, is done on a flat uh, loom, a you know, ground loom. So it's a straight weave. To do a twill, you need to have a vertical two-beam, because you need to be able to pull the weft away from the warp and make these sort of S patterns. Paula describes it far, far better than I do. The long story short is you need to have special technology to create a twill. And where do, how do we document the loom, which is almost certainly made out of perishable material? Well, we don't really document them. We have no evidence of these in Central Asia, per se, but we do have evidence for them in the Caucasus. And the original publication by Elizabeth Barber in the 1990s suggested, like most people would have thought, that you know, the evidence for the ex expansion of twill from the earliest known looms in the Caucasus to Western China, where the other fragments have been found, was across the Eurasian steppe. But now that we know more about the Inter-Asian Mountain Corridor, and the occurrence of twills along the corridor in these early uh, textile impressed ceramics, I would suggest that in fact the much more likely route, these are of course loom weights, which is how he documented the loom itself, um, how Roger documented it, that in fact the path more likely follows the populations that would have had access to wool, which would have been mountain pastoralists who would have been living along the mountain <coughs> corridor. So yet another branch of this early Silk Road, if you will, going back to the Bronze Age phases and being propagated by pastoralists. Okay, so I think I've hopefully been able to convince you that there's a very an ancient origin to what we know as the Silk Road, this sort of trope of the Silk Road, and that that Silk Road may have been sparked by forces that we have yet appreciated. But we still need to talk about this question of geography. Is the Silk Road, or what we think of as the Silk Road, a phenomenon of cities connected by highways, or is it something else? And how does the geography, that all-important mountain geography that I mentioned to you, influence that development? Here's sort of an image of uh, elevations, sort of in a funny angle. I sort of tilted the world, if you will. Looking northward from the Iranian Plateau and Hindu Kush Mountains into China, and across the Himalayan Plateau, and this gives you a very different sense for 
what the world might look like if you're someone who spends a lot of time, time in mountains. In fact, most of it is mountains, right? Another way of thinking about this is who has more importance on world history, our Silk Road history, Marco Polo or sheep? In order to understand how those mountain zones really influence the connectivity of populations, we need to uh, recognize this all-important map, which is sort of something that came out of the Soviet literature, again, during my PhD phase. And I found this map, and it kind of like opened up the stars for me. It shows traditional summer and winter migratory, or sorry, uh, summer and winter pasture zones and migratory uh, vectors annually. What you see is in the summertime in the Eurasian steppe, nobody's moving east and west. Everybody's moving north and south. And that's because it's extremely hot and dry in the south during the summer, and it's lush and cooler in the north, and vice versa. It's extremely cold and freezing at 65 degrees north latitude, and it's moderately acceptable in, in the south at the fringes of the Sirgaria and Amudaria River. So steppe pastoralists, if you really want to know what they're actually doing, according to ethnography, is they're moving north and south. So all these models that show arrows going east to west across the Eurasian steppe, if those kinds of things took place, it's antithetical to the way that people actually live in those places. So that's just something to be kind of cognizant of. The EAP is in fact created by these short little bursts of mobility, which are up and down mountainsides. And that's because of this phenomenon, which ecologists call in environmental compression. Mountains bring us basically different, so we can go from desert to lush green pasture in 25 kilometers, as opposed to 3,000 in the Eurasian steppe. So if you're a pastoralist and you're not feeling like marching 3,000 miles every year, wouldn't you go to the mountains where you can kind of get all the best of both worlds and only have to move for a few days? I would, and so did a lot of pastoralists. And so that, or that purple band you see is a distinctively different migratory set of movements that shape this connectivity, this world of connectivity. And I want to illustrate it for you now in a much more sophisticated way. First, we have to recognize that animals um, don't always go where it's least cost paths. It's not, it's not the easiest place to go. When people try to reconstruct human pathways, they always use these runner's algorithms that assume people take the least, the, the easiest route. And that might be true for certain kinds of purposes. If you're just trying to get from A to B, you might take the least cost path. But if your goal is to feed these guys, they'll lead the way. Look at where all the herders are. And I'm kind of a bit pixelated. One in there. None of them are out front marching in front of the sheep. They're in the back. And the sheep dictate where they go. And they go over rocks. They go through patterns. And if you can see all of these pathways, these are all sheep tracks. And so I started working in the region. I began to realize that the entirety of Central Asian mountains was just scored with sheep tracks. And I thought to myself, these are the tracks of the Silk Road, but how to prove it? It was 2004, you know, computers weren't that good. And so I ran some models for my PhD that were like very contained, and they illustrated uh, some interesting set of patterns. They basically illustrated that if you lived in the lowlands, and the well, Bigash is actually located right in here, uh, right there, that's the actual location of Bigash in its, um, sort of projected space. I proposed that these folks would travel about five or six kilometers up the mountains to a rich pasture zone, which I calculated up to say it could totally support the number of individuals living in the lowlands, and this would have been their local migratory pattern. And you can begin to see what happens. Let's toggle back and forth. Boom, 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 there it goes. There's the network, right? It begins to form, but this is only a tiny little fragment of it. In order to understand how this might function over a vast amount of territory, I had to wait about 20 years for the computers to catch up. <laughs> because I needed to run the model at a very high resolution. I needed to run it with thousands and thousands of satellites and a lot of processing power. So literally about 10, well, 15 years after having published that first model in 2006, or with a little bit of data behind it, uh, I had a student who had been reading, sort of back reading some of my old work, and I said, you know, what about this thing? Like, can we do anything with this? Because it was not a particularly good publication, if I must admit. And so uh, I gave him the task of seeing if our computers could handle a big data set on the same issue. 
and we innovated a little bit, and we used a model that basically treated sheep as water. So it's not exactly how pastoralists function, but it does simulate the movement of animals from highlands to lowlands and back in annual sequences and treats them not like logical animals or logical beings that go for the easiest path, but in fact treat them like the animals that they are, which are grass-hungry beasts. And they want grass. And so we trained the model to follow the best grass. And this is what you get. Each of these tracks shows a potential route on an annual basis. And there's 10 of them kind of sequenced in this, in this uh, animation. The red lines represent the most number of sheep. In other words, that's the preferred route that you would take that year if you were a sheep to get to these lowland zones. So the premise is you go from the highlands to the lowlands and back, and these are the routes you would take. And you can see that each year, theoretically, they change quite a bit. But we're not looking for what happens each year. We're looking for what happens over thousands of years. And so when we take this data, which is now extended from basically Western China all the way to Iran, so we have the entirety of Asia in this case, um, and we aggregated not 10 runs, but 500 of those simulations, it creates very, very durable, dense lines, those dark red lines. And those dark red lines correspond almost perfectly with the known archaeological sites of the Silk Road. So when you say the Silk Road, this is what the Silk Road looks like. These might be the dominant roads. In some cases where you have very limited capacity for movement, you have very specific trails. Now, I want to point out, we did not use any of the dots to predict the lines. So the lines are separate, totally. They're only calculated on the basis of what you would do if you were a sheep and you wanted to eat grass under very, very like, reduced conditions. So it's an extremely um, error-prone model. I mean, you do that in, on purpose. You want the model to be as sort of you know, rough as possible so that when you get correspondence, it actually means something. And what we can see, for example, in areas where you wouldn't necessarily expect a logical location to be, for example, at 3,500 meters elevation in the highlands of Kyrgyzstan, you have the hotel, i.e. caravanserai, of Tashrabat. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a hotel builder, but if I was, I wouldn't build it at 3,500 meters unless there was a reason to do so. And I think the reason is probably represented by these folks who are living there today in their yurts who are pastoralists. It's really good pasture. And so there are folks already who know the routes through the mountains at the very earliest times when communications began. And so this is the source for how the Silk Road actually got rolling was because pastoralists knew how to move through the mountains and knew how to uh, connect between one another from basically the moment they started. So all of this then gestates, right? So we go from the Bronze Age kind of incipient stages of this to a thousand years beyond, and you have uh, nomads trading with people in the lowlands, and the Han are engaged, and people are talking to one another, and they cut the ribbon, and the Silk Road's rolling, and now it's a thousand years later, and we're talking about a very, very a politically charged world where you have um, major empires in the territory of China, you have major imperial forces in Mongolia and to the north, and of course you have constant pressure coming all the way back from the mid-first millennium BC, if not sooner, from the territories of the southwest in Iran and, and further to the east, sorry, further to the west. So Central Asia now becomes this nexus, and the Silk Road is right mixed into it. There's a lot of money, and this is that sort of prosperity that we think of in the medieval height of the Silk Road. But what you don't think of is a place like this playing a role. This is an elevation of 2,100 meters in the border zone between Tajikistan, which is these high peaks in the back, and the foothills in southeastern uh, Uzbekistan. And we went there because we were trying to look for, look for more Bronze Age sites, which we found. There were some. But the exciting thing that we found, and unfortunately it's hard to visualize, is, um, so we've done some animation for you, and you can see this kind of bound here, um, and I'm going to show you more details of it, but that struck, out, struck us uh, conspicuously as a place covered in ceramics and archaeological evidence, and what's there is basically this city. Now, this is a very comical sort of reproduction, but it does the trick. Um, this is what is actually underneath the ground there. 
And this is one of the highest elevation sort of cities known in Central Asia. There are a handful of others, all kind of, I think, related. And the site of Mik, the one that was scrolling that first video, is only a few kilometers away up, up the valley. And I'll talk about that in a second. How do we know that that's actually there? Well, we first started by just collecting the surface material and doing sort of standard archaeological survey. But then we realized that we could go back with, with uh, geophysics and not have to dig anything, but actually try to surmise the plan of the city using ground penetrating radar. And here you can see layer by layer how the, how the radar works is it shoots 10, 15 centimeter layers. And you can see literally out of the ground the plan of the city emerging. Now, it still looks a little bit like a Rorschach test. So I'm hoping that nobody's getting upset or you know, is having any kind of moments of, of anxiety. Oh, I should have mentioned in the last slide. Oh, I took it out, sorry. Um, here's the, the different zones. So when we sort of combine those layers and digitize what we can find, and remove the noise, and add in a little bit from the other forms of other sensors we have, because these are the burials, this is the burial ground, and they don't have stone architecture, so we had to use a different set sensor. So this is from a magnetometer. But you can see all these little dots. Over 400 bodies buried on that hillside, and we excavated 40 of them so far, yet another one of my PhD students' uh, work. Um, and what we now see is about a 10 hectare city. A small city, town, city, whatever. We can, just, we can debate those issues. I've published it as a city because of some of the elements that it has, specifically the citadel, which we excavated uh, last year. And uh, you get a sense now from the sky what's going on. You see these large architectural blocks, and then it continues out. I mean, this is just the, the actual citadel mount, which is all encompassed in this orange block up there. And uh, we can see the architecture. In fact, we can tell you of the chronology and the phasing. There's three major phases of citadel architecture. Continuous, with rebuilding. And here's the kicker. These, this city spans three major imperial transitions. All different. So you have the Abbasids, which is basically this, the Islamic Caliphate, and their expansion into Central Asia. The Samanids, who are a Persian kind of, um, uh, maybe like a, Sartrepi, I think, of, of the Abbas, of the later, of the next phase of the caliphate, but essentially an independent uh, um, political entity. And then the Karakhanids, who are in fact a Turkic nomadic confederacy, the term itself meaning the northern Khans. So these are a northern force which deposes the Samanids. It's an incredible sort of, uh, you know, talk about Game of Thrones. This is, this is a, a much more interesting sort of sequence of historical practices. And when you see them, in each of these three um, architectural rebuilds. Now, you might just say, well, fine. You know, throughout time, people rebuilt their cities. Well, it's not quite that simple. When we look at this, the citadel of Tashpulat, first of all, we notice that it rivals, or is at least similar in scale, to some of the much larger capital cities in the, in the region. So the citadel is not much, in fact, it's larger than the one at Penjikent. It's similar in size to Afra Siab, which is basically ancient Samarkand and uh, can be compared to a number of, of other citadels, which is why I refer to this location as an urban location, because it actually mimics, in many respects, major urban planning that we see throughout medieval, uh, the lowlands of medieval Central Asia. Um, and so again, here's some of these sort of reconstructions that we've done on the basis of the, of the magnetometry. So it's not totally fantastical, but you know, we, we, we intentionally kept it somewhat comical because we don't have a full understanding of all the architecture. Um, but what we can argue for, definitely, it, on the basis of our excavations, is that this place was a trade center. So, for example, we have a whole plethora, albeit small in number, but a wide diversity of hand, sorry, of wheel-made glazed ceramics at Tashbulak. So these are all the fragments from Tashbulak, which directly correlate to fine wares found in major urban centers throughout the lowlands during the Karakhanid period. Now that's not strange to think of because the Karakhanids would have likely controlled this, this highland zone as well as the lowlands at the time of these ceramics. We also have some more interesting elements like coins and mirrors and uh, early Islamic ceramics with, with actual um, Kufic, inscript, or Kufic uh, uh, inscriptions on them or painting, epigraphy I guess. We also have evidence for what they were eating, at least in, in some of the parts of the site. And in fact, their diet was pretty good. These folks had all sorts of yummy fruits and vegetables, cherries and melons and 
walnuts. This is all the, the fruits and, and, and trade market items. And they also had some staples, wheat, barley, peas. So they were being provisioned, we think, or in, at some level they might have been growing a little bit of, they, they could have planted wheat, I guess. It's high altitude, but it does, it is possible. It's not um, great growing territory, but it is possible. Nevertheless, they're almost certain, we know that, that none of these other items, like apricots and such, they do not grow at that elevation. So they're definitely being, there's definitely part of a trade network, which is one that we know existed on the Silk Road to this day. Here's a beautiful uh, synergy of that thought. Here's a photo I culled from the Library of Congress, taken in 1913 and recolored, so one of these wonderful remasteries of black and white photography. And here's my own photo. And when I found this photograph, I was struck by it. And I said, you know, this looks very familiar. I'm going to dig through my own archive of slides. And here's a photo I took in 2003. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure those two individuals are related, <laughs> based on their scowls. <clears throat> Um, but this is the same location in Samarkand. So you can just project this back another 2,000 years and you're probably going to be seeing a very, very similar set of walnuts and apricots and everything else. These are fruits that come from this region and you, if you want to read about it, you can read the wonderful new book recently published by my student who I've mentioned a number of times, Rob Spengler, who wrote a book called Fruit from the Sands where he discusses this whole process of these fruits and vegetables, which in part stems from this work that he's uh, helped with at Tashbulak. But before we get too far into that, I want to skim through some more of the evidence. We also have evidence for, blacks, uh, for, for blacksmiths and for steel production. So we have a lot of metal on the site. It's expected. It's a medieval site. Um, but we actually did some slag analysis of, some of, these, of this workshop. So going back briefly, here's a little uh, workshop area. You can see some of those burned uh, zones. And the, the slags, which I'll just skate through quickly, show a very interesting product. And that product is called hammer scale. Hammer scale is the product of this. This is the process of making high carbon steel. Uh, I had the great benefit of having a National Geographic team out with us last summer, or 2018. And we specifically went to contemporary blacksmiths today, working in Bukhara. And they showed us how they make Damascus steel. And what they do is they hyperheat these steel items, and they fold them over, and then they bash them to create that beautiful watery uh, line by increasing the carbon content. So you need to have carbon content to create this sort of high carbon steel. And you might say, well, who cares about high carbon steel? And the reason why you care about it is it not only produces really beautiful things, but it produces weapons that then become very important for major missions like, say, defending crusaders. So when the Arab armies of the Middle East start to buy weaponry, they're buying high carbon steel weapons from Central Asia. We know this from the documents, and I'll talk a little bit about it later. But Seljuks, everybody else, they're all using these beautiful high carbon steel weaponry, which is not available in China in the 10th century. I'm oh, sorry, and not available in Europe in the 10th century. And so this sort of silly cartoon depicts, you know, the Europeans laying down their, their, their crusaders, laying down their, um, their sort of insufficient swords in front of the Arabs, who in this case had far superior weaponry, i.e. the first arms race. So why is all this relevant to nomads? Well, while we have some glazed ware and we have clear evidence for trade, and we know that Tash Bulak was linked in to this network of communication across the highlands of Eurasia, 90% of the ceramics or more are actually these vessels. And they continue unchanged through all three phases of those imperial shifts. So these communities are like a little city-state sitting up in the mountains, ignoring everybody else, and or not fighting with them, but trading with them. So again, remember the image of the nomads attacking the walls? attacking the walls. They're trading. They're perfectly ensconced within three different empires, within three different linguistic traditions, and within three different cultural traditions and religious traditions. And they're trading. And this is what their ceramics look like. They look like this, and they look like this. Hand-painted, slipware, almost prehistoric in their characterization. Yet this is what the dominant, this is the largest assemblage of, quote, Karakhanid pottery ever located. We have tens of thousands of fragments and will soon be published by my current graduate student, who's a specialist on now on this topic. Before we leave 
the mountains and these urban centers. We need to come to some conclusion about what was going on and how this helped facilitate the Silk Road in its maturity. In 2015, we did some reconnaissance around Tashkulak, so areas sort of to the north, south, east, and west. Knowing that the site of Mik is located only three kilometers away, we went in the opposite direction and went downslope about 100 meters in elevation, but about five kilometers in distance. And what we found was this enormous city. Here you see two huge defensive towers. This one you can see is called so pyramidical. You can see the territorial boundary walls, just for scale. And I just want to <clears throat> scroll you through how large this is. Central Citadel Mounds, those are those towers. The city is about 40 to 60 to 100 hectares. We don't know because we haven't actually mapped it fully yet. The distance across this platform, this is those huge collapsed uh, towers or fortresses or construction, all of this is architectural. All of it. One, two, three. We're going to zoom in on the next one. Another tower here. Four massive fortifications. And this city is sitting in the mountains untouched. Not a si aside from collecting something on the surface and doing some drone mapping, not a single bit of evidence has been discussed ever in the world on this site. To me, that is the most compelling reason to not believe what we think we know about the Silk Road. This set of cities, this one's known as Tugunbulak, will fundamentally change how we understand highland nomadic communities and their engagement with lowland populations, their formation of empires, their development of urban centers. This is a huge city lost in the mountains that no one has touched. It, it, it sort of boggles my mind. It was so boggling that I stopped working on the Bronze Age to work on the Middle Evil period, <laughs> because that's how interesting it was to me. When you think about Tugunbulak and how it fits in with Tashbulak and the others, here's the real final narrative. Tugunbulak and Tashbulak are neighbors. Mick is not too far away. Soren Stark, who was here, I understand, not too recently, in fact, long ago, has found similar kinds of slightly smaller and slightly less um, administrative, perhaps, but nevertheless other constructions of the same time period. And when he found them, his initial reaction was, these must be outposts of the Lowland Empire, because that's what everybody always says. And this is saying nothing negative about Soren. Everybody would have thought that. It's not until you do this amazing collection of these other ceramics and start to begin to realize that nomads can build cities. And nomads can build cities in ways that we don't expect them to build cities that all of a sudden Saren's work now all of a sudden starts like the, the clouds part and you say, oh, this is part of a chain and we should find them all over the place. My colleagues in the Zerushan Valley are calling me saying, well, yeah, we got one up in here too. We begin to realize that this network, you know, we know of a couple of them, but if I use my Silk Road map, I just simply put a dot every time two major roads cross this is a potential treasure map for every Silk Road site that could have ever existed. And if I had told you 10 years ago, when we found Tashbulak, that there's a city in the mountains, everyone would have told me I was crazy. And so this is not crazy. This is highly possible. And what does it mean? It means that when we break these networks apart and we analyze them structurally, we actually have communities forming that have a very different political na narrative than what we expect to see when we think of empires of the Silk Road. These, this is a modularity map, which all that is is simply saying how connected is the network? How many nodes does a network form? And how isolated is that from the next cluster? This is a cluster map, so to speak. And what it shows is that the Silk Road map that I produced is actually highly modular, which means that if this is a nomadic map, that you should expect this to fit with tribal or clustered populations, which, by the way, is exactly what the texts that we do have about the Karakhanids say. They break their political units into these kinds of modules, each of them controlling a small region, and the product of that is their ability to exist within otherwise seemingly very homogeneous imperial boundaries, but in fact occupying this boundary as it shifts and moves around these different communities and different large-scale political units for hundreds of years. So I'm going to close now. The Karakhanids are only the end of this story, but they're not the end of the Silk Road story. The Karakhanids introduce literature and arts and some of the earliest world maps. This is a world map produced in the 11th century by 
uh, Al Kashgari. Some of the most amazing architectural uh, productions, like Mon the Mausolea, etc. The Karakhanid Empire is the empire that no one knows about, largely because of the Mongols. I blame the Mongols. Everybody thinks of the Mongols as this sort of, you know, amazing Central Asian influence, and they were, no, no question about it. But there was a lot of other things that were happening amongst nomadic communities. The Karakhanids were a confederacy of nomadic tribes, and that confederacy did some amazing things. They lived in the lowlands. They occupied and, and maintained political structure in the lowlands. And now we know they built mountains and they built cities in the highlands. And we have no idea yet as to really how those functioned. We're, we're, we're hopefully going to be publishing a paper within the next uh, six to eight months that will give us some sense. Or I mean, we have an idea, but we have to kind of wait to see what happens. So. All that I've spoken of is in part due to the team effort that is the last 20 years of research in Central Asia amongst myself and my students. Um, we have two, three major you know, projects still running. The project in Kazakhstan has been taken over by my outstanding student, Paula Dumani. Um, the project in Uzbekistan is still theoretically under my guide, but um, these two fantastic scholars are, will be soon to inherit it. Um, Lenny Rouse, who I didn't mention, she works on early Bronze Age work, or early Bronze Age nomads in Turkmenistan, another outstanding project director, and of course Rob Spengler, who seems to have his hands in almost everything from China all the way to, to, uh, to Europe. Um, and then recently, and, and interestingly, we've been branching out into Western China and Tibet to try to understand how these regions fit within this broader narrative. It's a long, slow process, but one that I hope I've convinced you can begin to reshape our understanding of what we call the Silk Road. Thank you.